Well, we have two gray cars, but it's not a gray day. It's a beautiful day in March, and we are comparing two three-row crossover SUVs. What do we have today? Well, we have the 2023 Toyota Highlander on this side, which is in its XSE trim, the sportier version. And on this side, we have the 2023 Kia Telluride in its X-Line trim. It's sort of outdoorsy, kind of very on-trend sort of trim. Exactly. Both of these are mid-sized three-row CUVs. Both of them have all-wheel drive. Both of them are all-weather capable, but under the skin, a little different. This is a V6, that's a Turbo 4, and as we go farther, we're gonna find they have even more differences. And although they're very similar on size and capability, they are quite different on price and features and in how they'll serve the families that purchase them. Exactly, I think the biggest thing is that even though they look a little close on the spec sheet, these cars drive pretty different. Should we start with the Toyota and find out? Sounds good. Let's do it. Okay, so now we're in the Toyota Highlander XSE. Mm -hmm. This has a lower starting price and a lower as tested price than the Telluride. The Highlander starts at $49.9 and as tested, including the $2,000 destination charge, uh, $52.7, mm -hmm. as you see it here. Mm -hmm. so basically, the base Telluride is at $52,000, which is basically where the Highlander as tested is. Right. And our as tested Telluride, which we'll drive in a little bit, is $63,000. So there is a price delta here to be accounted for. There is. However, when you look at what we're driving today, the XSE and the Highlander versus what you get in a base Telluride, the equipment is very similar for the price. So even though the two cars we have specifically today are not completely equally spec, mm -hmm. you could spec basically the same content and the same price if you mix and match the spec sheets on both, is what you're saying. Yes, and if you want to go up to the level that our Telluride is in the Highlander, you're going to be paying about the same amount for the equivalent amount of features. So you're looking at two different price points and two different levels of the vehicles, but if you want to match them up side by side on price, they're going to end up being about equal. So the first thing I noticed when I got in this car is I really like the red interior. You it's know, a color in a crossover. And, uh, as soon as everybody opens this door, the first thing you hear is, ooh, it's so different. It looks great. And that's one of the low risk things that automakers can do to really make an interior more exciting is just give it to us in an exciting color. Mm -hmm, so true. And it's not like it's white, like it's impractical to keep clean. It's red, it's fun. Um, and then I think the longer you look at this interior, the more things stand out that kind of bother me. Uh huh. Like for example, this screen which is actually a larger screen than you would get on the base Highlander, and it's still very small. It's much smaller than the dual digital display that you would get in the Telluride, or even the standard display in the Telluride. That's true, however, I will give props to the fact that Toyota has put the latest infotainment system that they offer here in the Highlander as part of the refresh, and part of that is that it has wireless Apple CarPlay and Android Auto, which the Telluride does not offer, period. That's true, it always drives me nuts when car makers have wireless phone charging and no wireless CarPlay and right. Auto, because that's the whole point of it. However, if we're gonna pick apart the wireless phone chargers, the wireless phone charger here in the Highlander, as much as it's great to have the wireless connectivity, the charger is not very good. See, let me just put it in here and, yeah. and it's out. And it, it's, it slides it's out. around and, and if, if I accelerate, it's gonna come back, yeah which is a shame because otherwise it's easily located and you have full wireless capability in this car. It's a shame that there's not some kind of grippy surface to hold the phone in. I, I noticed it that the longer I would drive with this car with the wireless charging, it would just knock itself out. It would just stop charging because it's not held in there very securely. That's right. And tell your ride, it works much better. Agreed. So circling back to what you said, I think I do need to mention what a quantum leap this infotainment system is over Toyota's previous system. Yeah. Which I thought they licensed it from Atari. This is such a huge <laughs> jump forward. <laughs> it's true, however, there are a couple of things that still need some work, like that backup camera. The backup camera is fuzzy, just like I remember them in like 2015. Mm -hmm. It might be the same unit. Uh, it is worth knowing that for more money, you could upgrade to a 360 camera, such as we have in the Telluride, mm -hmm. but I haven't used the 360 in the Highlander, so I don't know if the resolution is gonna be any better. Right, some people love having a, a shelf in the dashboard and some people don't. I fall into the latter camp. I just find that it attracts clutter and dust and I really, it bothers me. But if you want it, it's here. 
I would say that junk expands to fill the space it is allotted. And in a car like this that's going to be used by people with, uh, you know, larger families, I would say it's going to attract a lot of flotsam and jetsam. Agreed. But overall, I would just say this interior is a good step forward for the Highlander, but I wouldn't call it class leading. Well, one point of improvement is the new engine here in the Highlander. Uh, well, improvement depending on how you look at things. So it goes from a V6 into a 2.4 liter turbocharged four-cylinder engine. Which delivers more torque and less horsepower. But the main improvement with the new engine is you do get better fuel economy and markedly better fuel economy than the Telluride, it must be said, because it's a smaller engine, it is turbocharged, and runs on regular fuel. I think when you're talking about a family crossover like this, Toyota's hit it on the mark where the gain and torque is going to be a bigger benefit to most drivers than, than is going to be a hit to the loss in the horsepower, right? It gets up to speed really well. Um, the amount of power is great. I think the only thing from a powertrain standpoint that I would submit as a complaint is the transmission. I agree with you. I think that transmission is the biggest difference in how these drive. And I'm not being overly picky. I know that none of these are sports cars, but the Toyota transmission is just so lazy and slow. And when you get into that really sharp unit in the Telluride, the differences are really known, even in just like regular driving, it's much more pleasant because of the transmission in the Telluride. Fully agree, fully agree. And with the, tra the turbocharged engine in this, it would benefit so much from having a smooth transmission with quick lower gears to help it even more get up to speed. It's really not making the best use of that lower end torque by having a transmission that's, you can feel it holding the vehicle back. Exactly. When you have big boost in a small engine, especially when you have a lazy transmission, you get that rubber banding effect. It kind of does nothing, does nothing, and then will slingshot you forward with a lot of exuberance. And also worth knowing that both these SUVs are like actually really quick. Yeah, they are. The amount of power on both, I have no complaints. They, um, they'll they serve the needs of the average family very, very well. I mean, for somebody who's just going, you know, accelerating on the highway on the way to soccer practice, nobody's going to have any issues with either one of these vehicles. So as we mentioned, this is the XSE trim of the Highlander, and there are a couple of different suspensions that are available, not only in the Highlander, but in a lot of different Toyota products. The majority of Highlanders will give you this suspension that's sort of more bouncy and more floaty and it sort of it goes with the flow and it rides a little bit over or relax yes over over bumps and and things that you find in the road this XSC trim comes in what they what they call the sport suspension and that's I, I prefer it when I'm looking at those two side by side I find it's a little bit firmer a little bit more flat yes you feel a little bit of the uh, what's going on the road a little bit more in the cabin however um, in general I just find that it's a little bit more composed and and uh, better handling this suspension versus the other. I think that Toyota engineers and Buick engineers probably share the same definition of what a sport suspension is. <laughs> I'm not claiming it's actually in any way sporty. I'm just saying it's it handles better than what you'd find in most Highlanders. The ride in the Highlander is quite good. It's very comfortable unless you are the person that happens to be in the third row. Right. Now, Toyota uses the same floor pan on the gas version that we have and the hybrid version of the Highlander. And in the hybrid version, the battery pack is stored under the rear seat footwell, basically where your feet would go if you're a rear seat passenger, which means that if you're sitting in there, gas or hybrid, your knees are kind of up by your chest. It's a compromise of that design, and it just means that it's a less comfortable third row than a Telluride. Well, and it's pretty narrow, three wide as well. So you can technically fit three people back there in theory, but they're not going to enjoy themselves between that and, and the knee issue that she mentioned. There are no USB ports in the third row in this vehicle. You can get them on the Highlander in higher trims. However, they're standard in the Telluride. So overall, the third row experience is going to be better in the Telluride. However, I suppose that's why the Grand Highlander exists. That is true. <laughs> Maybe we'll compare that one next. Yes. Continuing our look in the, the back end of the cabin, the second row is actually a good, comfortable place to be in this. It's a nice low trim to offer captain's chairs for, for the XSE here, and there's a console between them that has cup holders that are really easy um, and nice and low, easy access for children to use when they're sitting in car seats. So that's a thoughtful um, inclusion there that's not, that doesn't exist in the Telluride. The Telluride's cup holders are on the back, 
of the center console, which is great for adults, but a little bit harder for children to reach. Yeah, and I think it's a good compromise between being usable as a cup holder and also being low enough that you can step through it to get to the third row. Yes, that's true. Although in theory, you may not need to use that pass through because the second row seats come nice and easily out of the way with a simple push button on this and in the Telluride. They're very similar in their operation. However, neither one of these SUVs offers a second row seat that pushes ahead and allows you to keep a car seat in place in that second row, which is something that other SUVs in this class offer. In the front of the cabin, one thing I do like is this nice sliding back access to the center console. It's a roll top, but it doesn't look like one. It's actually really clever. It uses this flexible vinyl. I think on the top mm -hmm. and inside the space is quite generous to hold various cords and knickknacks. Not quite as generous as the Tellurides however which has a traditional opening but it's a little bit wider so things like my my small purse fit a little bit more easily into the Tellurides than here in the Highlander. Yes and also in this era in which we are in between charging setups we have USB and USB-C connections up front. Mm -hmm. We're always it's gonna be this awkward two or three year phase when we phase over from USB to USB-C. With that, I think we've kind of summed up the Toyota Highlander, and I think it's time for us to hop into the Kia Telluride. Let's do it. We could drive all the way there, get out of this car, and get into the other one, or we could simply snap our fingers and be inside it. I know you have the magic fingers. Let's do it. And just like that, here we are oh, in the 2023 Kia Telluride. Shall we begin? Yes, we shall. So let me run through exactly what we're driving here. This is the X-Line trim. Now Kia has been introducing these X trims as sort of outdoorsy um, trims on multiple vehicles that they offer. And that's a very on trend thing, it seems. A lot of people want their crossovers to at least look outdoorsy, if not be truly outdoorsy these days. The X-Line is the second from the top trim that's available on the 23 Telluride. The top trim is the X-Pro, which actually does integrate some outdoorsy, more or outdoorsy capable elements like 18 inch wheels with um, all-terrain tires and, and that sort of thing. Whereas the X-Line that we're in here has some, some appearance things, but it is more of an appearance trim. That's true. I think the good parallel between this would be the CX-50 Meridian trim. Mm. It kind of does the same thing. It adds some black fender flare looking bits, but you're not really bushwhacking in this thing. Yeah, no. However, this is a mid-size three-row SUV, CUV, that can seat up to eight passengers, and so it's got that going for it. So with the Telluride, we should start on the inside, I think, and work our way up, because oh. this is an interior that impresses. It I does. stepped in this, and I felt like I was in an entirely different class of vehicle. Yes, however, there are a couple of things that, that you should know before you get into exactly how luxurious this thing is. This is not real wood, although I could be convinced, believe it was real wood nobody let me touch it um, but it, it's you know it is plastic paneling and this is plastic paneling but um, some compromises need to happen somewhere and for the price point this is a very impressive interior you've even got these little grab handle thingies on the on uh, these X trims at least um, the, the, this is more of a luxury vehicle kind of feature yes and with the nice stitching on it too like honestly I can't think of a better interior for this money and especially once again with a fun interior inside having an interior just not be black is yes. such a leg up yes. it's really all it takes anything other than black is going to look really nice mm -hmm. but really the attention to detail throughout the interior is impressive mm -hmm. I like the grates of the speakers I like the faux brushed aluminum there's some nice bright work in here it really does feel like you're in a you know a budget luxury car rather than a dressed up you know mid-price car. Mm -hmm. uh, and we do also want to talk about the displays in this. The front digital display with the gauges is an option. It depends which trim level you get, but the center display over the center console is on all Tellurides and it is excellent. Now, before we move away from talking about the instrument cluster, we should say that if you're looking at an equivalent price point to the Highlander that we're testing, just like that Highlander, you do get, as you mentioned, the, the um, analog gauges. So to get the digital link, you have to pay up where in the neighborhood that we're in. That being said, this is a really beautiful setup. The infotainment system works very well. I'm sort of, the, the purple is a little bit youthful, I suppose, but it's growing on me. However, we don't have wireless CarPlay and Android Auto. I'm gonna keep saying this Hyundai and Kia until you fix it. No wireless CarPlay and Android Auto in the upgraded 
infotainment system because there's a standard on this but it's the upgrade in other Hyundai and Kia vehicles and it's just not cool that it's not all the way up to the latest technology. It is a shame especially when you consider that the wireless phone charging is so much better integrated here than in the Toyota. Speaking of features that are in some Kia vehicles and not others one thing I would see as a benefit I think in this version of the Telluride is it doesn't have that single integrated screen at the bottom of the center stack that has the climate controls and the infotainment controls on the same panel. You know the one I'm talking about? Now you see me, now you yeah, don't. Kia EV6 does that. Right, and there's a, uh, the new Sportage and a couple other things as well. It's a cool idea and concept and I really wanted to love it, but the more I use that, that panel, the more confusing I find it. This has traditional buttons and dials and you can use it with gloves and everything's very clearly marked and although it is a little bit large and busy, it's, it's more functional, I find. And I think that if you're looking at buying a Kia Telluride, now is the time to get one while it still has <laughs> this because at some point the other system's gonna get added in and it's just not as user friendly. Putting all the controls usable and visible at once is a, is a wild concept. I know. and kind of like it. Maybe we're old, but <laughs> apparently everybody wants to have all their buttons hidden these days, but I, I still like this system. I would say the other big difference from behind the wheel is the powertrain is very different than Toyota's. We have a naturally aspirated V6 and a much sharper transmission, and it really does transform how this feels. It feels like the sportier of the two vehicles to drive, even though the power output is basically the same. Mm -hmm. 291 horsepower, 262 pound-feet of torque from this 3.8 liter V6. It's very spry. It is, and I think the transmission helps, because as you mentioned, it's, it's a lot sharper. It's a much more satisfying run up through the gears in this. It just feels smoother overall. What about handling as you drive this thing on city streets? How do you find it? Uh, I do find it more maneuverable and easier to drive and easier to park. The sight lines in the Telluride are better. It's better to, it's easier to park in tight spaces. It feels more maneuverable. It's overall just a more dynamic and easy to drive vehicle. And I would say that's true even in spite of the fact that this comes with that top view monitor that is not equipped on the Highlander. It's available, but not on the XSE trim that we're driving. Even without that, I would say this is easier to get around, easier to judge in positioning to um, vehicles in a parking lot. Or, it's just easier to use. Yeah, absolutely. In addition to the traditional door pockets and center console, there's more pocket down here on the side and there's a little bit more to work with in the back as well. As a counterpoint to the point we made in the Highlander, there are cup holders here on the back of the center console, but because they're on the back of the center console and not closer to the seats, younger kids might have a hard time reaching these. Um, it's too bad that neither of these vehicles has those cup holders that are integrated into the armrests that you see in some of the other three-row SUVs on the market, because those are the best ones for kids. They're much, much more within reach. But between the two, I would say this is, this is the lesser set up for, for putting kids on the second row. Adults are gonna be fine. I think just overall, there's just, it appears to be a much more thoughtful interior. And when you move back to the third rows, you have USB-C charging ports for both people on the outboard seats of the third row. And they're standard, which is interesting um, because you can get USBs in the back of the Highlander, but they are not standard. Access to the third row is about the same. Here is in the Highlander, the, the system, the functionality of the second row seat is the same. However, you're not gonna have that same effective feeling like your knees are in your chin that you will, to a degree, but not as nearly as much of a degree as you would have in the Highlander. That's true, and while we sit here, we can open our second row sunroof. Yes, available, not standard, but available. Um, and that does help to increase the airiness of that rear cabin quite a bit. The amount of space behind the third row is significantly more here in the Telluride. It's 601 liters in that space behind the third row as opposed to 453 in the Highlander. And the seats fold nice and flat in this versus the Highlander. So lots of good access to, to a good, clean, flat load floor to get your stuff in and out. It's got more space and it's easier to use that space. Mm -hmm. So let's pretend for a moment that the Telluride that we're driving here is the equivalent in price and trim to the Highlander, which would be the base EX. So the larger screen and the USB ports are a big bonus. You're losing the digital instrument cluster, you're losing the rear sunroof, but you're also 
looking at the safety equipment being more or less the same between the two, the Telluride, even in its base trim, still has the addition of a junction turning assist feature, which will prevent you from turning into oncoming traffic, and also the safe exit assist, which will prevent kids in the second row, or occupants in the second row, let's not be judgmental, <laughs> from opening the door into um, traffic if it's on coming behind you, including cyclists. And it's worth noting too that, you know, when you also, you still get the good bones that we like here. You get the V6 engine, you get that sharper transmission. So I think we're ready to make our verdict. Are you ready to sort this out? I think we should wrap it up and declare a winner. So we've now driven them both. Let's summarize our findings. Which one would you say has the superior interior? I think the Kia Telluride's interior is way better than the Toyota Highlander. It feels like another class of vehicle inside. I like the stitching, I like the design, and I like the better integration of wireless charging for my phone. The center stack's usability is also better with it not having that swappable screen at the bottom and, and a set of buttons that's easy to maneuver even with a set of gloves on. Exactly. The controls inside the Kia are super easy to use and they are glove proof, which is good on winter days. Okay, now which of these two has better fuel economy? In terms of fuel economy, that's a simple answer because the numbers are what they are and in that case, the Toyota Highlander is the winner. It's that four-cylinder engine which is a little bit more efficient and that's always going to be the case when you come down in size, but the fact that they've managed to bump up the torque while still keeping that fuel economy low is a bonus on the Highlander side. What about overall performance and drivability? Where would you award the win? I mean, honestly, we're not talking about sports cars here, but the Kia is much nicer to drive. I like that crisp eight-speed automatic. I find it easier to park. The visibility is better for lane changes and tight maneuvers. Overall, I prefer driving the Kia. But it's worth doing that the Kia does cost considerably more than the Toyota. Which of these do you think is the better value for money? Well, we've been transparent about the fact that we're not comparing apples to apples here in terms of trim levels, but when you do bring the level playing field into consideration and bring the Telluride even down to its base trim, it's got a little bit more going for it in terms of features. And so the value for the money, no matter which way you look at it, ends up falling in the Telluride's favor. And with that, I think we probably have enough to crown a winner. The winner of this driving.ca comparison is... The Kia Telluride, but if you want a Toyota Highlander and you're not going to settle for anything else, the XSE trim is the way to go. For driving.ca, I'm Clayton Seams. And I'm Stephanie Wallcraft. For more SUV comparisons and other features, follow us on social media, visit our website, or hit the button to subscribe. And don't forget to tell us in the comments what we should compare next. <laughs>